Hello, everyone, and welcome to the training webinar for March of 2019. As usual, we will be recording this session and it will be made available on the Foundation website as also on our YouTube channel. Today's class will be, uh, our trainer will be Marin Lawrence from the University of Kansas Medical Center. My name is Rudy Potenzone from the Foundation. Uh, we are using GoToWebinar, so you are all muted, but um, if you have questions during the session, you can type a question into the question window or raise your hand uh, on the control panel uh, or also even type something into the um, to the chat screen. This is part of our uh, annual training program, which we've been running for a couple of years now. Um, and today's class is on the basics of I2B2. Uh, you can see we have other classes during the year on uh, ontologies and uh, glowing bear. Uh, trans using Transmart, uh, etc., and I uh, invite you to attend some of the other classes as well. Uh, just so you know, I mean, we've been doing this for a couple years now. We've trained over 500 people in using uh, one of the uh, foundation's um, platforms. Uh, as I said, you can go to our website uh, and see the recordings. All every training class is recorded, and the slide decks are made available there. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel. Uh, which looks like this. And uh, we have a set of playlists that include um, our, our webinars, uh, our community meetings, all the training classes, as well as any uh, activities that we have. And so we invite you to um, look at uh, some of the previous classes. And uh, we also always welcome your comments and suggestions. <clears throat> so let me go back to the beginning here. So uh, I'm delighted to introduce Marion Lawrence from the University of Kansas Medical Center who's going to cover uh, using I2B2. Marin? All right, thank you so much, Rudy. Am I able to I will change to the presenter to, you should get, okay. you should have a window now to present. Okay. All right, can you see my yep. I2B2 yep. hair and overview? All it right. looks great, yep. So I'm Marin and I'm from the University of Kansas Medical Center and here to do an overview of how to use I2B2 and our instance is called Heron. And so I'll go over how we, um, we provision access here at KUMC, um, why you might want to use I2B2 or Heron, um, the various registries that we have locally, um, training resources that we've put online for all sites to use, and then some basic search techniques, review of data that's available here at KU, um, and it, it's likely similar at other sites, and then how to search I2B2. So in order to access HERON, um, we require that individuals either be a faculty member or be sponsored by a faculty member, have their human subjects training done, so that's the city training, and then sign our system access agreement. We only um, make it available here at KMC on our secure network or via our VPN. And then in order to log into Heron, um, like I said, people need these three credentials and we just show it to them on the website um, so that they see what they have completed. And then once they have those three credentials, um, they can click on Start Heron Search. And then the reason to use I2B2 um, is a way to combine multiple data sources and so then users can search all of these data sources for the information that they want. Um, so we've brought in EPIC or O2 data, billing data, which used to be built out of IDX, and then various registries. So we have our trauma registry, our national cardiovascular disease registry, and our cystic fibrosis registry. We also have our tumor registry um, and some others. So we do de-identify everything before we bring it into I2B2. So we've removed um, patient name, address, MRN, et cetera. And then one additional thing that we do, we do date shift. Um, so any part of a date except for the year is considered identifiable. And so we have date shifted everyone's information up to a year in the past. And so you'll see in this example, patient one, their date of birth and their asthma diagnosis, both are date offset by minus 60 days. 
And so here's the real date, and then here's the date that would appear in Heron. Patient two is minus 20 days. So it's consistent within a patient, but it is different between two patients. For the most part, this is not a problem for research. The only times that it is a problem is if you're looking at either seasonal changes or if you are looking um, at a policy change. So a lot of people you know, know that a change went into effect on July 1st, 2018 and they want to study before and after that change. Um, and in that case, we would want people to get identified data. So some reasons that you can use I2B2. So you can get feasibility counts. This is great for grant applications um, and just to decide if your, query, if your study is feasible or not. You can also request raw data, at least at KUMC. So we allow our researchers to request the identified data sets without IRB approval. They can also request identified data sets, and that either requires IRB approval or a quality improvement letter of determination from the IRB. And then as far as prospective studies, our researchers can request data on patients in a research study. Um, so if they've already recruited 1,000 patients to their trial, and now they decide that they want hemoglobin A1C on all of those patients, we can go ahead and give them the hemoglobin A1C on all of their patients. We also use it to help with our patient recruitment. So we have two registries, the Frontiers Registry and the Pioneers Registry. And so in this query, you'll see that um, they were looking at patients with ulcerative colitis on a certain medication who were in the Frontiers Registry, and it returned 344 patients. So these are patients who are eligible for that study. And I should mention that the registries are, these are patients who have um, provided consent to give their contact information for research. Um, so we have the Frontiers Registry, which are specific to our health system patients, and then the Pioneers Registry are patients in our community who've agreed to participate in research. And so then we've linked it up with their medical data, specifically for the ones at KU Health System, um, in order to be able to provide their contact information to researchers. So we here offer a number of training resources. We offer Lunch and Learns twice a month, and then we offer a yearly fishing trip. We do typically broadcast those by GoToMeeting, so if anyone ever wants to attend, you are welcome to. Um, and then we'll do group presentations for departments. We also have a number of online training resources which can be accessed from our website, and then they are also available. Um, here you go on the kumc.edu, EAMI, and then Medical Informatics page. And so this is accessible to everyone. Um, even if you're not at our institution, you are welcome to take a look at all of our resources. We have Heron Introduction, so some basic information about Heron or I2B2, some facts about using it. We've put together a PDF training manual. Um, so this goes through kind of everything you might want to know about how to use I2B2 or Heron. Um, so how, how it's organized, how to run a query. Um, so we've tried to put a lot of resources available. We also have training videos online, and these are also available on YouTube. So everyone is welcome to watch those. Right. Within Heron, there is an I2B2 help a Heron help, an I2B2 help, and another help page that we've added with our training videos. So uh, those are just some help resources within the I2B2 interface. And then so we'll go ahead and get started searching. Um, so I was going to do an example of a cohort. So if we wanted to look at patients with hypertension, who have a family history of hypertension, who've been in the hospital for more than two days, and then we'll exclude anyone who's passed away or who is under 18, and then um, if you were doing a retrospective study, you might want to also look at their blood pressure, so I'll show you where to find that. All right, so we'll go ahead and start searching. So this is our Heron homepage, and you'll see in the upper left we have our Start Heron Search, so I'll go ahead and click on that. All right, so this is the interface, and I'm not sure how many people on the call are 
users of I2B2 or not, but this should look familiar if you do use I2B2. Um, so in the upper left, we have our terms that we can search on. So these are all of the data elements that are available in Heron. We have our workplace. Um, so I'm a super user of I2B2, so I see everyone's folders. But most people only see the shared folder, which allows users to share queries between um, investigators in their own personal folder. So this is just somebody's user ID, and they can keep their own queries in there, and only they will see that, and then people on our team. And then in the bottom left are all of the previous queries. So again, I see everyone's queries, um, but most people only see the queries that they have run. Um, and we do save, at least at KMC, we do save these indefinitely. So we'll go ahead and get started searching. And the way the tool works, it's a drag and drop tool. So you can open up a folder, and I'll go ahead and open up demographics. And if we wanted to search for pediatric patients, I can pull over the zero to nine years old. And then you always have the choice in I2B2. You can either pull over the whole folder for 10 to 17, or when it's out of folder, you can open it up and get more specific. So now you'll see I can choose 10 years old, 11 years old, or maybe I just want to look for 0 to 12. I can click Run Query, and a pop-up comes up. It auto-names it, but I typically recommend that teams name it themselves. Give it a good name. So you can do 0 to 12 years old. And then you can save the patient list if you want, or you can just choose number of patients. So for right now, I'll just choose number of patients. It runs. It tells you how long it's been running down here in the bottom right. So it's about four seconds. And then we know that we have 84,000 patients um, who are 0 to 12. If I wanted to see how many of these are female, I'm only recruiting females to my study, I can go ahead and add that to group 2. So things in the same group um, have the logical condition or, so it's 0 to 9, or 10, or 11, or 12. And then things between groups are and, so it's 0 to 12 and female. I'll run that. So 38,785. So that's just a basic example of kind of how to drag and drop. And then we'll go ahead and get into the specific example here in a minute. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and review what data we have available. And I think that that's one of the hardest things about learning to search I2B2 is just knowing where to find the data. Now, this is going to be organized slightly different at different sites, but it should be similar. So we have brought in alert data. This includes the best practice advisory alerts in EPIC. Um, largely, one of the big things in here is the medication drug-drug interactions. So if we scroll down to the bottom, you'll see that we have med interaction checking. And I can open this up, and then you can find various medications. So drug allergies, drug drugs, um, pregnancy warnings, TPN. So there's all kinds of different warnings that pop up. And then within the folders, you can find what the alert status was. So what did the physician actually do? Did they cancel it? Did they defer it? Did they filter it, hold it, override the alert? Um, so those are kind of, these are called modifiers, these blue circles. And it gets more specific about the data. We also have allergy information. And again, we have these modifiers. Um, so if I go into animal and bumblebee, we can, you can see that there's a whole reaction list. So you could either pull over that you want them to have any kind of reaction, or you can get more specific and you can say, I only want um, people who have anaphylaxis to bumblebee. So that's kind of the way you pull over the modifiers. We have cancer cases from our cancer registry. We've organized it in two different hierarchies. It's just the data is organized differently for you to look at. So you'll see this is kind of more of a layperson layout. And then this is just from the NACER hierarchy. Um, so in here, you'll see your site summary. So if we wanted to look at how many patients had breast cancer, you can pull that over and run, run this, and you'll see that how many patients have breast cancer. So 14,000 um, have been diagnosed with breast cancer and seen at our cancer center. 
We also have cardiology lab results. So this is where we store our echocardiogram results. And within that, you can find um, the ejection fraction and other, other variables that might be of interest. We have our cardiovascular registry. So this is a national registry. We only bring in the KU patients. Um, and this is the National Cardiovascular Data Registry. Um, and so here are some of the data elements that are housed within that registry. We also have the Cystic Fibrosis Registry, as you can see here. And then we have our demographic information. So I was in this folder earlier to look at age, gender, race, ethnicity. We have marital status, language. Um, a big one is vital status if you wanted to exclude patients who are deceased, but that's within this folder. We have our diagnoses, which are broken down into ICD-9 and ICD-10. It's a pretty large folder, so sometimes it takes a minute to load. So you'll see it's broken into ICD-9 and ICD-10, and we'll get into that. I guess we can pull up our hypertension codes now while we're here. So what I recommend people do when they are searching a lot of times people come to me and they want to look for hypertension, but they don't necessarily know the codes. So I recommend going to Google, hypertension ICD-9. And you'll see that Google gives you a number of different codes, 401.0, 401.1, 401.9. So it often gets you in the ballpark. And then you can come in here and navigate to it. It's Ours is done numerically. so. hypertensive disease. And the codes that Google was recommending were within this folder, 401.0, 401.1, 401.9. So you can choose to pull over any of these folders, multiples of them, or you can go ahead and grab a higher level folder. So I'm going to grab all of 401. So this encompasses all of these subfolders. I'll do the same thing for ICD-10. And I already Googled it, um, and so it's I-10. So I'll go ahead and go down to diseases of the circulatory system, hypertensive diseases, and then I'll go ahead and grab essential primary hypertension. I can run this query. And we'll find out how many patients have hypertension. The next folder we have is flow sheets. And so I'll just go through this next folder while the query runs. We came back with 245,000 patients have hypertension. So our flow sheets, this is, um, these are in Epic flow sheets. And so primarily it's documentation for nursing staff, physical therapy, occupational therapy. You'll see on here that we have a six minute walk test. Um, and so you'll see the distance walked in feet um, and then various other things that are on that flow sheet. There was gait speed, total number of laps. Um, so there's a lot of nice data in the flow sheets. Some of the flow sheets are free text notes, and we have done work to de-identify the free text flow sheets. We've done a lot of auditing to make sure that PHI isn't getting through. Um, so we've brought in a number of the flow sheets. Pain assessments are documented on flow sheets, line strains and airways. Um, if you have a fistula that's draining and how much output, that's all on a flow sheet. All right, so the next folder is history. So we have family history, social history, surgical history. And on my example of inclusion criteria, we were going to look at hypertension who have a family history of hypertension. So if we go ahead and look in the family history diagnosis, we can come down here to, uh, to circulatory system, and we will find hypertension. And so there's a negative history as one of the modifiers, but we want to look at positive history. So I'll pull the positive history into group two. And if you open up this folder, we could have gotten more specific. I could have said how many people have a father with hypertension. 
Um, but I'll just look for any family history of hypertension. So I pulled that over and then I can run this. Other things in history, so in social history, this is where you'll find tobacco usage. And so we've run in all of the data from the medical record as far as if people um, use tobacco or not. All right, so we have 71,000 patients who have hypertension and also have a family history of hypertension. So quite a number of patients with both. All right, our next folders, we have lab tests. And we have this, again, in two hierarchies. So we have this by our KUH hierarchy. So this will be familiar to how physicians at KU order, the, order lab tests. So we have chemistry, and then you'll find various things within chemistry. Here's general chemistry. Um, and this is where you'll find albumin, creatinine, all kinds of general chemistry. We also have it by the LOINC hierarchy, and so LOINC is the national standard for lab tests. And so you'll see it's organized slightly differently. The high-level folders are different, um, but this allows us to share queries from our institution to other institutions who also use I2B2 and use LOINC codes. We have medications. These are organized by VA class. And so there's a number of different medications we can look at later. We've also brought in microbiology results. We've brought in orders. So this is everything that's been ordered, but not necessarily completed. Um, so you can see all kinds of different um, consults is a big one. Um, so if they've had an inpatient consult to something, um, that's in here. But all the orders are listed in here. We also have procedures. So this is what has actually been done. Um, and so we've brought in CPT codes, HCPCS, and then the ICD-9 and ICD-10 procedure codes. We have brought in the ability to link REDCap projects. So if a user has a REDCap has data in a REDCap project, we can actually allow them to bring that into Heron. And if they have um, if they have an MRN field linked, um, we can link the data. We have research enrollment. We have specimen data from our biospecimen repository. We have the trauma registry data. Under visit details, um, this is where a lot of what clinics they've gone to, um, as far as we have our vitals in here. And then we also have um, visit notes. We've de-identified all of the physician notes. So right now we have pathology notes. That's new. We're going to do radiology notes next, and then in, under note types, you'll find um, progress notes is our biggest our biggest one. And so I can drag over progress notes, and then you can search for various texts. So I had somebody who was looking for people who were truck drivers, and so you could look for the word truck driver and click Run Query, and then it will return all the patients who've ever had a progress note that says truck driver. Um, you can also obviously look for genetic conditions or any kind of rare, rare thing. You can just do a search for the contains. Our final folder is our Visient data. Um, so this is, it's now called the University, oh, it used to be called the University Health System Consortium. And so this is our quality data. Um, that the hospital reports on. And so in here is where we typically grab when patients have been in the hospital um, because they have to report all the ICU days and all the hospital length of stays. So in our hypertension example, I'll just go back to that. Um, in our hypertension example, We have the hypertension, the family history of hypertension, and then we wanted to look at patients who had the hospital length of stay for more than two days. So when I pull over the hospital length of stay, anytime I drag over something that's numeric, so whether that's a lab test, a hospitalization, um, 
or anything else that's numeric, a pop-up comes up and it offers that I can say less than, greater than, so I will say greater than two. We'll go ahead and run that. And so you'll see from the example, pretty much every high level bullet point becomes a new group. And so hypertension, there's multiple ways to define it. And all of those ways are all in the same group. Um, and then family history, that becomes group two because we wanna say hypertension and family history of hypertension and the hospital length of stay. And then so next on our example, we want to exclude those who are deceased and those who are zero to 17 years of age. Okay, so you'll see our number returned. And so I'll go ahead and I can add a new group. And I will go into our demographics folder and I'll pull over pediatric patients, zero to 17. And then under, dece under vital status, I'll pull over deceased. And we've also integrated the social security uh, death master file. So if somebody has a social security number on file at KU, we do check to make sure that they've not passed away according to the social security data. And then there's an exclude button in the upper right of each group. So I will click exclude and then we can run this. This time I'm going to save the patient set and I'll show you what you can do with that. So you'll see if I open up a query where I did not run the patient set, this one, the hypertension plus hospital length of stay, under results, you'll see I just have number of patients. That's the only check mark I had clicked. If I open up the top one under hypertension cohort and open up the results, you'll see number of patients plus the patient set. So if I want to use that patient set, I can go into the demographic plugin and simple count. So if I just want to use one patient set, I can go ahead and drop that patient set and click on view results. So this will give us the breakdown of their demographics, so their age, their race, their language, all get broken down here. So you'll see the distribution of ages is here. We have slightly more females than males who meet this criteria. The race is broken down here. Primarily English speaking, marital status, so 8,000 are married, almost 2,000 have been divorced, uh, the religion is listed here, and then at the bottom, the vital status. So we excluded people who've passed away. So uh, this bar shows not deceased, and this at means unknown. This comes from Epic. It's actually in their, in their table. Um, they have a yes, they've passed away, no, they have not passed away, and then they have an unknown. So we do have some patients who it's unknown if they're living or deceased. That's what you can do with the patient set. Right now, we've been treating everything independently. There are other options here, though. So you can treat all groups independently, selected groups occur in the same financial encounter, or or define sequence of events. These are kind of the most popular ones. So I will go ahead and click selected groups occur in the same financial encounter. So right, right now, when I say treat independently, everything can happen at any time. So they can have the hypertension, they could have the hospitalization 10 years before they've ever been diagnosed with the hypertension. But if I want the hypertension to be at, in the hospitalization, um, 
that was more than two days, what I need to do is say selected groups occur in the same financial encounter. So I want the hypertension to be at the same time as the hospital length of stay. Now, the family history of hypertension, I don't really care when that got recorded. It doesn't need to have happened in the hospital length of stay. Um, so I can treat this independently. The other thing that you'll want to treat in independently is your demographic data in group four. Um, so we don't record the age or the deceased at every single encounter. Um, it only gets recorded once. So chances are it won't line up with that same encounter number. So I will run this again. And we can see how our numbers change. So our site does provide users with with data if they request it. Not all sites actually take the data out of I2B2, um, but we do offer that to our users. And we put it in a REDCap project. And so in REDCap, users can go to the records status dashboard and they can click, um, here are the patients that I pulled for this training set. And then here are the forms that they can choose from. Um, now these forms are based off of what was in their query. So everything that is in the query shows up in the forms. And so this, this one, I can click on the patient, and this is basic demographics that we give regardless of if it was put in the query or not. And then we give procedures. So this was looking at tonsillectomies. So they had put tonsillectomy as their inclusion criteria. Um, and so since the tonsillectomy was in the query, we pulled data about it. And we give the count. We give the first date, the last date, and then the last, the last code that was recorded. On the visit details form, this person had looked for, for height and weight. And so again, we gave the the count, the first date, the last date, and then the last value for both height and weight. Um, so this can be really useful for researchers if they did want to actually analyze the data. In REDCap, it's just a summary, which is sometimes slightly less useful, um, unless you're just looking at the first date that somebody was diagnosed with hypertension or the first date that they were diagnosed with some other comorbidity. Um, but we do also provide a zip folder. Um, so I'll click on the file repository. We do provide a zip folder of all of the data. So you can see, if I click on the data view table, this opens up a CSV file. And this is one row per patient, or I mean one row, sorry, one row per fact, um, and so multiple rows per patient. And this provides all of the data that was in their query. So for this instance, this is all one patient. And then you'll see here are three rows about their height. And so every value of their height and what date that was recorded on. Here's the start date. Um, so for us, if we have a cohort already built, so if this is our cohort, and we have 13,000 patients in our cohort, we can add another group, which we call our shopping cart, and then people can fill this up with the extra data that they want to analyze. So if somebody wanted to get all of the patients who we found in groups one to four, that, those are the people we want to study, we can fill up group five with the data we want. So if we wanted to look at blood pressure, I can go ahead and add visit details, and we have our vitals, and so I can pull over the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure. You might also want to look for various um, medications. So um, I think lisinopril is used. So we can go ahead and search our medication folder, use the find and search by names. And then if I search by, for lisinopril, click find.
And so I get a whole lot of results. And so oftentimes people are, they tell me that they come over and they pull each one of these over. The better way to do this is to actually hover over it and it shows you where it lives in the hierarchy. So we call these the tool tips. And so this lives in the medications folder under cardiovascular medications under ACE inhibitors. So if I go ahead, I'll go back to medication, cardiovascular, and then we have ACE inhibitors. So then I could navigate down and you'll see that lisinopril really only has three folders that I would have to pull over. Or I could decide I wanted all ACE inhibitors. So for now, I'll just go ahead and I'll pull over the lisinopril oral solution. I want to treat this independently because I just want the data on these patients. I don't actually want it to limit my cohort. So if somebody didn't have the systolic blood pressure or the diastolic blood pressure or the lisinopril, I want to keep them in it. So I add gender to this group because when it does the or, now it says, okay, if they don't have any of these top three things, they search everyone has a gender. So it will keep them in the cohort, um, but it will allow me to provide them data. That's a harder concept for a lot of people to understand, so hopefully that makes sense to you um, to add the gender in. If I don't add the gender, we might drop some of our patients. I think adding in the medications, this might run more slowly, um, but if it runs quickly, I can go ahead and delete the gender and see how our numbers change. The other thing that you might want to search for, you might want to search for a lab test. So perhaps you think about um, you know, diabetes and hypertension, oftentimes people have both. So maybe you want to look at patients' hemoglobin A1C. So I can go in here and I can use the find and search by names and go to lab tests and search for A1C. I can click find. And again, I could hover over and go back to the hierarchy to see if there's anything else around it that I want. Or I could know that this is all that I want. I want the hemoglobin A1C. Um, again, it's numeric, so it pops up saying that I can choose a value. I'm going to go ahead and say no value. Um, and then I'll also grab the point of care hemoglobin A1C. So this would be how I would set up my study if I wanted to pull data. So I would, I made my cohort, and then I made my shopping cart of the extra variables I want to study. So now for these patients with hypertension, I'll look at their, how many of them and who's been prescribed lisinopril what their blood pressure is, and then um, what their hemoglobin A1C is. So that's kind of a basic example. And then the other example that I have is about how to use the defined sequence of events and running the timeline. So I had a researcher come to me the other day who wants to look at um, how many patients have been seen in our internal medicine department and then gone on to go to the ED. And so I will just go ahead and, and do this example. So if I look under visit details, we can go to clinical service department per O2, outpatient visits. I can find general internal medicine. This is our internal medicine clinic. And then I can look at encounter type. Um, so we, we participate in the PCORNET common data model, and so these encounter types we've had to map for the PCORNET common data model. So I'll go ahead and pull over emergency department. And what I tell people, I like to kind of run things all the time. Every time I add a new group or add a couple of variables, I like to run it. Um, and I2B2 does crash occasionally, so the run is kind of like a save button. So I've had people call me and they're like, oh no, I built up this big query and now it's gone. And so the more you can hit the run, the more you're hitting save. And so I can go ahead while it's running, I can still continue to build my query. So, okay, so we have 13,000 who've been to the internal medicine and to the emergency department. But these patients, um, 
might have been to the emergency department long before they've ever been to internal medicine. And once they've been to internal medicine, they might have never been to the emergency department again. So we really want to find the patients who've gone to internal medicine and then had a visit to the ED. They could have a visit to the ED before internal medicine as well, I guess, but we want to at least know that they've had an ED visit after they've been seen by internal medicine. So I'll change this to define sequence of events. This is my population in which the events occur. So UKP, internal medicine, and emergency department. Event one is uh, internal medicine. And then event two is the emergency department. I can click on define order of events. And so I'll say the start of, I'll go ahead and say the first ever um, visit to internal medicine occurs before the start of, I'm going to switch this to say any ED visit, which is event two. So I don't care if they've been to the ED before, as long as they've also been to the ED after. So when I say any, right, their first might have been before the internal medicine visit, but their last should be at least be after. So by, let's say I want them to have been seen by internal medicine at least five days before. So I'll run this, and this time I'll choose the timeline. And so it will plot our data on, on, a, on a graphical representation on the timeline. The timeline always takes a couple of seconds to draw it, but hopefully this one will be quick. Are there questions so far? Okay, here's our timeline. Be thinking of your questions. Um, so on the timeline, each of these is a new person. So here's this block is one person, this block is the next person, and so on and so forth. So this top block is a 45-year-old um, black female. And then these tick marks represent the data. So we actually have it, it's kind of duplicated because because of the way the query is built. Um, when you do the defined sequence of events, we had to put the internal medicine in the population and then also in a, event one, and same with emergency department in the population and then in event two. So you're seeing it twice because of that. Um, so you really only have to look at the top two lines. So if you look at the internal medicine, here's where they've been seen by the internal medicine, these tick marks. I can click on it and I can see that this was um, on June 10th, 2017, and ended on, um, yeah, also ended on June 10th, 2017. And then this is when they've been to the emergency department. So you'll see the first one was before they'd ever been seen by internal medicine, but their last one was after their initial visit to internal medicine. And you can kind of double, I always like to double check that a defined sequence of events. I think it's easy to make mistakes when you're saying the start of this occurs before or after. Um, so I always recommend running the timeline and then seeing what your data looks like. So in this case, you can see all of ours are lining up how we wanted them to. This person has been seen by internal medicine and then they have a visit to the ED after. Um, same with this one, all, all of these are lining up appropriately. Again, like this patient did have the emergency department before the internal medicine, but that was okay by the way I defined it. Um, you can zoom on the timeline, and then you can also use these pan left and right to scroll left and right. So that's how you can get in closer to the data, especially when there's a lot of tick marks together. It's really nice to zoom in so that you can see, oh, they're actually not 
right at the same time they're spread out, but it's hard to tell until you're zoomed in enough. So that is the timeline. And then the other thing that you can do with the timeline, you can click on specify data. So if I wished that we also plotted, you can delete things. So at this point, I could delete the general medicine and the duplicate emergency department. If I wish we had have also, you know, plotted their A1Cs, I could go ahead and pull over their A1C, say no value. I could pull over their point of care hemoglobin A1C, no value. I could pull over to see if they were actually admitted to the hospital or not, hospital length of stay, no value, and then click on view results. And then it would add all of those things for the patients that we already found. Again, it might take a minute or two to draw up, especially with all of that data. Um, that's largely what I had to go over today. So what questions does everyone have on the call? Are there are there any? Feel free to write so in the chat. I, I, I don't see any questions, but I remind everyone you can raise your hand and I'll just turn off your I'll turn your microphone on. Or you can type a question into the question window. I think your presentation has been very clear. <clears throat> so, so now you can see that um, the point of care hemoglobin A1C also is plotted and the hospital length of stay. So this is a really nice way. You can click on it and you can actually see the value. And so that's a nice way for people to kind of know what they're getting out. So these are the columns that they would get out in their data table. Um, so I like to do that just as an initial kind of to see what um, to see what it would look like. Um, so yeah. So if there's no questions, I hope that I've inspired you all to go and use ITB2. I hope you have a great instance at your site. Um, <clears throat> and if you have questions, I'm, um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm also adding that uh, the the. Uh, I2B2 group maintains a public web client with some sample data. So you can go and try it yourself. I've just put that in the chat window. Um, and so that would be, uh, if you just wanted to try some of these things on your own with some uh, sample data, you can try it there. And I still see no questions. So uh, I will thank you, Marin, for a very, very good and very clear presentation. And uh, the recording will be available within a couple of days. Great. Thank you so much, and thanks, everyone, for calling in. Thank you.